Well, we are in the season of Lent. As we're walking through the season of Lent, we're walking with the people of Israel as they walk through the wilderness on their way from slavery into the promised land. And as we're walking with them, we're asking the question of what is it that we can learn from the people of Israel in, from their wilderness experience that might help us in our own seasons of wilderness when we're between life as we've known it and life as it will be. Some of these wilderness experiences have things in common. They are often seasons of life where we feel more pressure, more stress than usual, more uncertainty. Um, it's also an opportunity for us to wonder whether God is really there. It's a, it, there. We're tempted to doubt his presence and his activity in our lives during these seasons. Those are those are some of the things that, will, that these wilderness experiences have in common. But it's also true that there are different kinds of wilderness. And it is worth asking what sort of wilderness we're in. Um, if you are adrift on a raft in the middle of the ocean, that's a different kind of wilderness than walking through a hot, dry desert, which is a different kind of wilderness than hacking through a jungle. And the response that is required or the right thing to do in each of those situations is going to be different. Not every wilderness is the same. Pa part of the way they might be different is how we got into, those, into that wilderness. So far in the series, we've been focusing mostly on that kind of wilderness experience that sort of happens to us. That through no fault of our own, we're sort of thrust in to a season of transition or wilderness, but that's not the only way that we find ourselves in wilderness. It's, we don't uh, only end up there by accident. We sometimes end up there by consequence of decisions that we've made or actions that we've taken. It's just a different sort of wilderness. If a, somebody uh, gets behind the wheel when they've had too much to drink and they smash their car and they go to jail and they lose their job, they are entering into a jungle for sure. It's a wilderness season, but it's a different kind of wilderness season than the, the, one, the person who they smashed into, who now has to enter the wilderness of learning to live with, with a new injury or in a new way. So the, the kind of wilderness that we're in makes a big difference as to how we respond faithfully in that wilderness. When we are in the wilderness that is a result of our own actions, what we're going to think about is the wilderness of consequence this morning. There's a, a particular feature to that landscape, and that is that unlike the wilderness of, of accident, we, when we're in the wilderness of consequence, we often have an extra layer of shame over the top of it all that we have to navigate where we know that the reason that we're having to sleep in this bed is that we've made it ourselves. And in that kind of situation, it's really easy to think that there is no way that any good can come from this, that we just have to endure and that there's no hope. It is even easier to despair in the wilderness of consequence. But what we're going to see today is that whether we are in an accidental wilderness or a consequential wilderness, God can make it a purposeful wilderness if we are open to his working in our lives. So we're still in Numbers chapter 11, which is still on page 132. If you want to open up the Bible in front of you and read along, I'll invite you to do that or pull it up on your phone. Um, as we're turning there or pulling it up, let's turn to God and ask him to help us as we read and think together. Let's pray. God, we pray that you would send your spirit um, in a special way as we open up your word, because we need your help to understand it. Uh, we need your help to understand how it applies to us, and we need help understanding what it is that you're calling us to do in response. We believe that you're faithful to speak through this word, and so please open up our ears and open up our minds and open up our hearts as we open up your word so that we would be changed Whatever season of life we're in, or coming out of, or heading into, we pray that you would speak in a way that we can hear you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, so far in Numbers 11, the, 
people of Israel have been complaining about the manna that God has been providing them to eat, and they've been longing for the food they used to have in Egypt, and they are asking Moses for meat to eat, and Moses has talked to God about this, and here we read in verse 18 God's response, where the Lord says to Moses, tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed, if only we had meat to eat. We were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five, ten, or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses said, Here I am among among 600,000 men on foot, and you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? The Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not what I say will come true for you. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. And then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke with him, and he took some of the power of the Spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do do so again. However, two men, whose names were Eldad and Medad, had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It scattered them up to two cubits deep all around the camp, as far as a day's walk in any direction. All that day and night, and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than ten homers. Then they spread them out all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth, and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people, and he struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was called Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had craved other food. This reminds me a little bit of the worst birthday I ever had, the birthday where I got what I was asking for. My sixth birthday, I still remember it. The highlight of my fifth year of life was learning to read. And so my mom suggested, when my birthday rolled around, maybe you'd like to get some books. And I said, sure, books would be great. And so books is what I got for my sixth birthday. It's all I got. I remember it very clearly. I had books like Israel had quail, which would be okay for me now, but for six-year-old me, that was a pretty disappointing birthday. In our passage, Israel is receiving what they had asked for. They ask for meat, and God says, I'm going to give you meat. I'll give you meat till it's coming out of your nose. Now, before we get into um, that aspect of the passage, I want to just point out that God doesn't only give them meat. In fact, most of our passage is actually about God giving something else, something that they weren't necessarily asking for, but what they really needed, which was his spirit. Last week, we touched on this, that um, God responded to Moses' prayer by pouring out his spirit upon the people and enabling and empowering new forms of leadership to sustain the people during their wilderness journey. I think it's really important to see that before God gives this kind of judgment, he's also extending mercy. And I don't want us to miss it because it's so easy to miss. It's so easy to just notice the ways that God seems to punish and not see the way that God is actually providing all along. Before he sends judgment, we read for verses about how he sends mercy. And he sends it in ways that they don't even anticipate or are expecting. Even on these two guys, Eldad and Medad, who didn't even bother to go to the tent where all the action was going to happen, God generously 
supplies his spirit for them as well. So before we get to the quail, just notice that most of this passage is about God giving his spirit, God giving his presence and his mercy in the wilderness. But of course, there is the quail, right? There is this There's the truth that God sends his spirit upon these 70 community leaders. And then it says that the Lord sends a wind behind this flock of quail and sends them Israel's way. And it's interesting because in Hebrew, one of the fun things is that the word for spirit and the word for wind are actually the same word, ruach. So there's a word play going on. Both of these are coming from God, the spirit and the quail. And Israel wakes up to receive what they have been asking for. It's a February in Baltimore blizzard of quail. There, is, there are quail drifts up to three feet. Everywhere you go, you can walk in a day's direction, and you're kicking up quail the whole way. The kids are really excited because school is canceled because it's a quail day. (laughs) Okay, that was good. I'll stop. I had more, but I'll stop. The people of Israel receive what what they've been asking for. God sends them quail up to their eyeballs. It's as though he caught his son smoking cigarettes and is making him smoke the whole pack. But then it gets actually a little bit worse because he not only sends the quail, but then we read that he sends this plague and that people die in the wilderness. And it starts to get a little bit uncomfortable because we start to see that that this seems to be some of that judgment and discipline and punishment, these aspects of God that we worry a lot about. What are we going to make of this? Well, I think our passage has some things that we can draw out from it. First, I think it shows us that sometimes God's strongest medicine is to simply give us what we're asking for. That sometimes he doesn't have to come up with some dramatic way to discipline or to show his judgment, or he doesn't have to come up with wild punishments. Sometimes the worst punishment is just to give us over to the things we've been crying out for. And maybe that's actually the worst punishment of all. Maybe that's one way of thinking about what hell is. God giving to people what they've been asking for all their lives to be away from him, to live apart from him. C.S. Lewis said that there's two kinds of people in the world, the people who say, to God, thy will be done, and the people to whom God says, eventually, thy will be done. Maybe the first lesson that we have to learn is that God doesn't, that the worst kind of punishment might be to let us have what we're asking for. But I want you to see that even then, in this life, even when God gives us over to the things we're asking for, Even then, he's not just doing it for punishment's sake. He's doing it for the sake of redemption. If you look back at the first part of this passage, it's not like God is giving some kind, having a temper tantrum and then changing his mind and pulling a bait and switch and sending this plague. He actually tells Israel, tells Moses to tell Israel exactly what this quail is all about what it means, and what it's for. He telegraphs it to Moses and tells Moses to tell the people that these quail are coming, not because quail are so great and you deserve it, but because you have rejected the Lord. And so he's sending this as like an object lesson to tell the people to help them see the futility of what they're wanting and that how this doesn't ultimately satisfy them so that they would turn again to God and follow him more faithfully. He says, I'm sending you this because you have been longing for Egypt, right? So like the writing is on the wall. This isn't a great surprise. 
for Israel, it's a problem. And Moses tells them that. So it's like, spoiler alert, Israel. The quail is coming, but it's bad news that it's coming. So how do you think the people are going to respond? Well, this quail blizzard comes, and they binge like billionaires on Christmas morning. Look at verse 32. Verse 32 says, after this quail emerges, or, and they, they wake up to it, and it's as far as a day's walk in any direction. Verse 32 says, all that day and night, and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than 10 homers. How much is a homer? I have no idea, but thankfully there's a footnote. And the footnote says, that's possibly one and three quarters tons. Everybody is binging and hoarding on this quail that God has sent. These do not seem to be a people who are getting the message that God is trying to send. And so then God re responds to the severity of this situation. Their hearts are so hard to him. Their eyes are so closed to him. Their ears are so shut to God's purposes and God's direction that he does Something, another, he takes another step, and he sends this plague, as he did upon the Egyptians. He sent a plague in order to get Israel out of Egypt. He sent plagues in order to get Israel out of Egypt, and now he sends a plague in order to get the Egypt out of Israel. He's having to carve off those elements of the community that are most um, resistant to the direction that he is leading his people. It's a serious situation. If the people of Israel are longing, continue to long for Egypt, then what is delayed is this rescue plan that God began and promised with Abraham and is working out through the redemption of Israel from slavery. And it's going to result in the redemption of all of us and so this is not some sort of little situation so what do we take from this what does this mean for us in god's uh, in first corinthians paul tells us that part of god's purpose in this and part of its presence in our bible the purpose of its presence in our bible is to teach us something for our own lives, that this is to be an example for us. And so what might those examples be? Well, the first thing, I think, is that it shows us that um, even when God is, is, uh, is acting in a way that, is, that feels like discipline, he's doing it for redemption's sake. Even his discipline is an expression of his love. Hebrews chapter 12 says that the Lord disciplines those he loves. That all discipline is painful, but that any parent disciplines their child because of their commitment to that child's good and that child's future. So part of what we're seeing here is God's relentless and unswerving commitment to his people's good and to their future. God does not want Israel. He loves them too much to let them keep longing for slavery, to let them keep longing for what they once had. And in the same way, he loves us too much to let us stay in the place where we are. And so sometimes he brings us into the wilderness, sometimes even the wilderness of our own consequence, in order to help us see the futility of what we've been asking for, to lay it aside, and to turn to him and trust him in a new way. This is something that all parents get and all children don't get, right? That harsh, painful discipline can be for good and an expression of love. You might say, okay, so far so good, but there were people that died. This wasn't called the classroom of craving. This was called the graves of craving. That's what we remembered. And so what are we to take from that? Well, I don't think that we're supposed to be um, 
looking for quail plague forecasts or worrying, looking over our shoulders, looking for a smiting. But I do think it invites us to ask the question, when we're in the wilderness, especially the wilderness of consequence, is there anything in us that needs to die? Is there anything that God wants to shave off of us, to chip away from us? Is there anything that God wants us to leave in the wilderness? Because God brings us into the wilderness because he has lessons for us to learn there. And he also brings us into the wilderness because there are things we need to leave there. And so what in your life might need to die so that you can really come to life? What in your life is the sort of thing that if you hold on to it, it will hold you back from the direction that God is leading you. It might be painful, but that might be part of the reason God brought you into the wilderness, to put this thing up in front of you as clearly as a landscape littered with quail as far as the eye can see. You probably picked this up from my story about my sixth birthday, but my family is one that has always valued success of an academic sort. This uh, is good and it's bad. It um, has resulted in a sort of family that has that charming and hapless quality of being able to like talk about books at a six-year-old birthday party, but doesn't know how to change their own oil. I remember I once asked my dad a simple car repair question, and he looked at me with sort of a despondent look on his face, and he said, Andy, if your grandfather didn't know anything about how to fix a car, I don't know anything about how to fix a car. And I'm sorry to say, you're not going to know anything about how to fix a car. <laughs> so it's a genetic problem. It's not my fault. <laughs> but one of the ways that this worked itself out as I was growing up was that I, I pursued academic success, which I guess is a good thing, but for me, it wasn't only a good thing. For me, it also meant that I spent a lot of time um, kind of trying to look really smart and trying to look better than people around me. It resulted in a lot of pride and a lot of arrogance. And um, I remember there was this one time in college when I applied for this um, prestigious scholarship that was going to, at the end of the year, it would send me overseas to study for a year. And I remember I went into this interview and I did an amazingly terrible job in this interview. And it was clear that I had no business being there. And I had no idea what I was talking about. And I was quickly and uh, humiliated and sent out of this room because I had no business being there. And I even remember a few months later, uh, I was working at this restaurant and the winner of this award came with the committee for like a celebration. And I was their waiter. <laughs> and they didn't remember me. but I remembered them. <laughs> it was an opportunity for me. It was the beginning of God showing me a still ongoing lesson, but showing me some of the things that I thought I really needed, that I thought were really good, and that I thought I couldn't live without. Uh, him beginning to help me see that those things actually needed to be left behind so that I could grow to be the person that he was calling me to be. I needed to leave that behind. It needed to die. And I could only learn that when I went into a wilderness. We like to think about transformation, about how God's going to change us, because so often we only think of it in terms of addition. We think about the Christian life as being just God giving us more blessing, more wisdom, more insight, more success, more of the qualities that will make people like us. We think of the Christian life as just sort of one long process of a product being improved and a new and improved model each year coming out. That's what we want the Christian life to be. And God, of course, does bless us by addition. He does transform us by giving us gifts, but he also 
transforms through subtraction as well. The same Ruach sent, was sent upon the elders, and it also sent some quail. God blesses by addition and by subtraction. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he also said, Whoever wants to follow me needs to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. We all want new life. We all want transformation. But we don't often want wilderness. And we don't often want the cross. But the cross is where it all comes together. The cross is the place where God's judgment and mercy come together as the clearest expression of his love. The cross is that place where Jesus steps in and takes the consequences that actually were ours. He steps in and bears those consequences on his own shoulders, willingly. He came to take the consequences for our guilt, and he came to take the consequences of our shame. Do you remember that particular aspect of the landscape of the wilderness of consequence when we know that we're in this wilderness through our own fault and part of the problem is that we're filled with shame and immobilized by it? Jesus didn't just come to set us free from guilt, but he came to bear our shame away as well. He was punished so that we wouldn't have to receive the consequences of our guilt and he was disgraced so that we wouldn't have to carry the weight of shame. Jesus opened himself up for the consequences that should have been ours. And why? Why did he do that? The cross is that wilderness, that ultimate wilderness, where, where God suffers all of the consequences that should have been ours, so that the wildernesses that we walk through in our life need no longer be a matter of simply punishment and judgment, but of growth and transformation and refining and new life. Jesus went to that wilderness on the cross to transform all of our wilderness. The writer to the Hebrews says that uh, all discipline is painful, but that God disciplines those he loves so that they might share in his holiness. So that we might become more like Jesus. That's what the wilderness is for, for us. Whether it is the wilderness of accident, the wilderness that comes upon us, or whether it is the wilderness of consequence, maybe especially the wilderness of consequence, where we know it's our fault, that's the place where we can really look to the cross and recognize what Jesus has done for us. Because the wilderness of consequence, too, becomes a place not just of punishment, but of possibility. Not just of condemnation and struggle and challenge, but of change. So what is the wilderness that you find yourself in? What is the wilderness that you are afraid that God will take you into? What is the wilderness that you are still nursing the wounds from as you emerge out from it? Look to the cross, look to Jesus, and remember that he paid the consequences. He suffered the consequences so that we could be changed in the wilderness. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice, which transforms our wilderness. We thank you for your suffering, which transforms our suffering. We thank you for your faithfulness, which transforms our faithlessness. We pray that you would help us 
in the wilderness that we experience in life. Help us to ask what you are doing in us and what you want to do through us on the other side of this wilderness. Thank you, God, that because of Jesus, our wilderness can be transformed to be a place of hope. We pray that you would grant it to us even now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.